Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. It's my pleasure today to review a book which <clears throat> probably I should have reviewed a couple of years ago now um, when we were going through all of the great fun of the celebration of 800 years of Magna Carta. But actually, I didn't at that time for a number of reasons which are irrelevant. Uh, however, I've got the book now and I'm going to review it. It's called The Reinvention of Magna Carta between 1216 and 1616 and it's been written by uh, John Baker, Professor John Baker, who will be known to many of you. The book comes to us from Cambridge University Press. It's a paperback and it's part of the Cambridge Studies in English Legal History. Now, before I say anything else, uh, let me just say one thing, and that is you either like English legal history or you don't. I happen to like it because I think it's such a fundamental part of understanding where we are today with our legal world, where the rule of law comes from and how it's developed as people's attitudes change. More of that in a minute. The uh, review I've given, a title for the review I've given, is a refreshing new look at the sustainability of our brilliant Magna Carta. Because, and you'll hear a bit more about this in a minute, um, we do take it for granted to a certain extent. And I'm going to mention in a few minutes other jurisdictions where they recognise its importance, perhaps in a slightly, well, they take a slightly different view of it. Let's have a look at the book first of all. It's, um, a, as I say, a paperback. There we go, there's the front, there's the spine, and then there's the back. And the back, so you probably can't see very much, but it basically explains a little bit about what this um, this book's about. Let me just say a little bit about John Baker for anybody who doesn't know him. He taught at the University of Cambridge from 1971 to 2011, and latterly he's been Downing Professor of the Laws of England, and he also served for 30 years as Literary Director of the Selden Society and was given a knighthood for services to legal history in 2003. And he's still um, pretty active. This is the book itself. Uh, I've reviewed a number of, of books concerning um, Sir John, and I'm really delighted to review this one. You can see the index at the back. It's by page numbering. It's very detailed, and he makes. I'm going to make some points in a minute about how this book comes about, because there is one problem, and it's a linguistic one because we speak English now, but we didn't in those days. There's a bibliography, which you can see at the back, which I think is, these are secondary sources, and there are various appendices with some of the case law at the back. Now at the front, you've got some blurb, which I shall use for this review. Then you've got a whole series of books published by the Cambridge Studies in English Legal History. I think they're basically, I say this, I think they're, and I'm biased, they are preeminent. Uh, because I don't really think there's anything that, that comes near the quality and the depth of the work that we have on English legal history. As I've said, you either hate it or like it. I like it, and therefore that's why I'm reviewing the book. There's the front page there. Then you've got the blurb from CUP. Then you've got the content section, starting off with the legal character of Magna Carta, and then moving through. Magna Carta in the Inns of Court, for instance, very interesting. I'd have thought, as a member of Lincoln's Inn, one of the oldest inns you can, you can see and then you see how the indexes run through there are a total of 11 chapters the end one the final one myth and reality i think it's quite useful then there are 10 appendices you can see those probably there if i just move that in a bit you've got a, some idea of, of where we are we are talking about history remember and it says the year 2015 witnessed one of the most remarkable historical anniversaries ever celebrated stretching across continents and civilizations that of course was, and I can remember it well. We, we had wonderful celebrations. And in fact, on my wall here in my chamber's office, we've got Magna Carta actually framed. Now we go into the book itself after the preface, which was written in April 2016. This book is, has been around a little while, which is why I've only just caught up with it now. But you've then got acknowledgements and you've then got the tables of statutes and so forth, general charters. Uh, quite a lot of very detailed information. I have to say I'm not that interested in that side of it. I'm more interested in the general uh, concepts that come out of it. The tables of cases are fascinating. If you've ever been into the law libraries of the Inns of Court uh, libraries, you will know trying to find some of these books is really quite interesting, <laughs> especially when they're tucked away. You can see the tables of cases running through by name. 
and that's how they're basically found. Some of these names you'll remember from your legal studies probably um, many years ago, I certainly do. Then you've got a list of abbreviations, always helpful with English legal history. You can see the details. That, that tries to point you in the right direction because there's an awful lot to pick up of what has happened over the, over the uh, years. And then after that, that's the end of the abbreviations. You then get to the legal character of Magna Carta, chapter one. You can see quite a lot of footnoting. And that runs all the way through, lots of footnotes and a huge amount of information. And as I say, it's not for the timid, but I thought this was a particularly interesting book. So what do I say? I, I call it a brilliant Magna Carta, which it is, of course, it's taken for granted. But let me say it's an exceptional paperback, this book. Caught our eye when we looked at the dates that it covers 2016 to 1616. Now anybody who understands anything about Magna Carta will remember its tortuous history and we only just have actually celebrated 800 years of its sealing and therefore this book is rather a useful examination of what happened in the first 400 years and of course the answers lie in the brilliant prose, the written work of Professor Sir John Baker uh, based, of course, on his um, first-class lectures. Being published by Cambridge University Press under the uh, series Cambridge Studies in English Legal History. And I've already commented on uh, the importance of that particular series. The publishers say, quote, Magna Carta was largely ineffective for practical purposes between the 14th century and the 16th century. The reason being that late medieval law lectures gave no hint of its later importance. And I think that's been a problem. I think even today there are quite a few people who talk about the Human Rights Act, they talk about rights, but the one thing that many people, they, under, they, they know about Magna Carta, but they haven't got a particularly detailed working knowledge of it. And I think this book does plug some of the gaps because that's where the problem is. The taking for granted of this charter, which doesn't figure that high, on the British agenda, whilst it's revered in the US, for instance, and other jurisdictions. You just have to go to Runnymede to see it was the, the American bar who put up the uh, monument, which um, I found a bit embarrassing to a certain extent. When I did actually ask that question of one or two people, there was a, a sheepish grin and some silence <laughs> from most of the politicians, because they really haven't seen, in my view, the enormity of the decision when King John was brought to book. And perhaps one of the problems, therefore, rests with the fact that it's primarily a legal story and the sources are not written in English. And that's really what I alluded to earlier, because the problem is that, of course, we did not have English and effectively the beginnings of modern English until certainly Henry VIII and, and thereafter. Obviously, Shakespeare is English, but it's, a, again, quite difficult. Chaucer, of course, is impossible for many people because it is basically a, a different type of English and you therefore have to understand um, all the influences going back the, from the previous centuries. And so using a reality test, um, this in my view is a formidable and learned work. It's not for the timid uh, or the uninitiated, uninitiated in matters of the sealing of Magna Carta. However uninterested many parts of the British public really are, although I suspect a lot of them are far more interested than they let on. Because even when I went to uh, Runnymede, um, there were a lot of people there and they've tarted the place up, thank goodness, after I did write an article prior to the 800th anniversary stating it really did need to be tidied up a bit. And I'm hoping one or two people took notes. Probably not, but never mind. What we get from John Baker, though, is he gives a flavour of the content. Writing, for instance, let me give an example of that. A treatise by William Fleetwood, round about 16, uh, 1558, was still in the traditional mould. But the lectures of the Puritan barrister and MP, Mr Robert Snag, in 1581, and the speeches and tracts of his colleagues advocated new uses for it. So you can see that it was a very, very slow gestation period, if you like, in terms of recognition. And it's called the reinvention. It is the reinvention of Magna Carta because it's a restatement as well of, of where we are. And then there are the long years, described as centuries of oblivion until 1587, 
um, when there were eight reported cases in which chapter 9 was cited. That, of course, you can't see it, but it's over there because I've actually got Magna Carta on the wall. And the celebrated jurist Sir Edward Coke, or Cook as we call him, it says spelt Coke, but he's Cook, made extensive claims for chapter 29, linking it with habeas corpus, producing the body. And then as a judge, of course, Cook was a very important judge between 1606 and 1616 when he deployed it with um, effectively a, an important uh, challenge on encroachments on the common law and the liberty of the subject. And I'm sure you will all remember his very important role at a time of massive upheaval during the uh, rather sad Stuart period of our history. The book ends in 1616. I know I'm giving some personal views here, but I can't resist it. But the book ends in 1616, a long time ago, and the lectures of Francis Ashley, summarising the effects of the new learning and then Cook's dismissal for pushing his case too hard. So it's a challenging new account. And just to end, and I don't know whether Sir John would like this at all, but I'm going to say history repeats itself. And we will go through periods where there will be have to be a new reinvention, possibly a new re reassessment of where we are. But the thing that I like about Magna Carta is it's survived. It's not religious. It's nothing. It's about very basic stuff as we as human beings have to identify with. And I think that is more important than anything else. The paperback book was published on the 11th of January 2017. I'm recording this in 2019, but I do want to thank uh, John Baker very much indeed and everybody who's involved in this work. It's first class. I've never attended any of his lectures at Cambridge, but I'm really delighted to have this information. Now, I mentioned William Fleetwood. I've opened the book in the middle. There he is. Um, he's referred to, obviously, in my book book review. You can see there are lots of footnotes all the way through, as to be expected. This is a common, for instance, there's, that is very important as well, the commentary on Magna Carta, because all the way through we've had commentaries, and we've had, in this case, what, what, he, what Baker is calling the reinvention of Magna Carta. As I say, that's really what it has been about, because the one thing I think is most important, and it shows about the longevity of our democracy, for instance, in, in um, Great Britain, whatever you want to call the country, United Kingdom, Great Britain, the British Isles, it's the fact that this has run all the way through and it survived. And I think that's what the Americans like about it as much as anything else, because there's always a danger that you get um, someone who's not quite the right sort of person to be in the White House. And I'm not mentioning any comments in 2019 about anybody, but looking back, you can see the need <laughs> for... Uh, Magna Carta to be there and to be there always even if it's lurking in the backgrounds in the shadows it's there and I think it's a great help to everybody so thank you I'm an enthusiast as you gather a big thank you to Cambridge University Press and Sir John for an excellent work bye bye